<laughs> what triggered your you to say, hey, I need a team? Because I'm going to get to something, man. Like, at that point, I wanted to duplicate myself, okay? Mm. Because I was like, okay, the effort that I'm putting in is not enough. It only is making me this much money. So if I can duplicate myself, maybe we can make, you know, we can make more. So that was the the, the thinking back then, right? So that, you know, that was essentially what it was. I just wanted to duplicate myself. So as I was recruiting people, I would just teach them exactly what I know and tell them to do exactly what I was doing, right? And it didn't work out. Right, because it's like it's only one me, right? So then, fast forward, I realized that when you recruit a team, you should not try to duplicate yourself. You should try to solve problems that you don't want to deal with or that you're not good at solving, mm -hmm. right? So then, that, when I understood it, that's when that's where I got where I am today. Because in my recruiting process now, it's all about what I don't want to do or what I cannot do. It's not about finding another Benny. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, at first, when I was recruiting people, I will get people, hey, do this, go drive for dollars. Go do everything I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. It didn't work out. Mm. But now, it was more like, okay, I'm cold calling and driving for dollars. I'm going to hire people just to cold call. So, that way, that's one thing I don't have to do anymore. So, I can focus on driving for dollars. So, if I hire somebody else, I'm going to hire them to drive for dollars. So now I remove myself from the business. Now I can think about other strategies and other ways to add to the business. And then when I find those ways and I do them myself and I master them, and then I can hire somebody to do them. So it's more so delegating now. It's not about no duplicating. It's delegating my process now. So that's how I could grow an actual business now. You know? The mistake about a lot of wholesalers is that they make money and then they switch up their lifestyles. And they forget that wholesaling is really just a transaction business. Mm -hmm. It's not like an asset. You can sell your wholesale business. You make money, and then you got to go back marketing again, make money, and that's it. There's nothing that you own, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of realized that early in the business that, hey, we need to make as much money as possible and invest in actual other, like, assets, you know, whether mm -hmm. stocks. I'm heavy in, like, stocks and dividends. that literally pays for my life right now, mm -hmm. you know? So... But that strategy session was really understanding the number one thing in the wholesale business, which is marketing. Extremely important. Like, your wholesale business is a marketing business. That's why I told you we have 40 VAs. Like, we have a call center, literally, with a manager that manages that call center, right? So we had to understand what it was. And then what, the way we set up our business is that we have a call center. We have 40 VAs. So now we didn't have 40 VAs right away. But we knew we were going to have a lot of VAs. We had four. We grew up to 10. And then so on and so forth. Right now, we have 40 VAs. So... We have 40 VAs or 40 call callers. We have two other VAs that manage our SMS campaign because we send a lot of text messages as well. Those VAs, when they get hot, hot and warm leads, they, tr they push them through our system to a CRM where we have in-house acquisitions uh, agent mm -hmm. that get those leads and they call back the sellers mm -hmm. to negotiate and talk to them and, you know, and lock up the deals. Mm -hmm. And then we have a transaction coordinator after they look up the deals that kind of manage the closing process with mm -hmm. the closing attorney, with the seller. And then also we have a dispositions department mm -hmm. that manages the back end with the buyer as far as marketing the deals and trying to onboard the buyers. So we had to figure out that, that process, process first, like before mm -hmm. even engaging in the business, we had to figure out. And now when we knew what it would take and we kind of realized, okay, it would take money and it would take a lot of effort to really recruit the right people to put them in place. So we spent the first, I would say, two to three months tightening up that like the system. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So we made sure we tested it at a small scale first. You know, we had, like I said, four VAs that we scaled to 10. We had one uh, acquisition uh, agent and we grew up to two. We didn't even have a transaction coordinator at that point. I was mm -hmm. doing it before even employing anybody to, to replace me. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing dispo and transactions. So we kind of operated it at a small scale. When we saw that, okay, this is working. Now we start removing ourselves and delegating, and then we kind of grow. So again, during that strategy session, we discuss all the stuff. We already mm. had the picture of the business. That sounds like it take a couple of days, dude. Like the thing is, like we already were in the business. Got you. So, so it was a, so it was easy. It was, it was really... easy. We talked for like one day. You know what I'm saying? Nah, you came to my you. crib, a little bottle of wine there because I'm heavy into wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, a little bottle of wine there. My wife was cooking all that good stuff. So me and him were just sitting and talking. You know what Got I'm saying? You. It took us a day because we already had experience in the in the in wholesaling. So, it was last year, man, I gotta say, bro, like I was going through like almost a depression, man. Like mm. when I was kind of exiting my partner, my partnership with with Dooley, 
because I mean, again, that's a good ass friend of mine. Like it was mm-hmm. tough to really see that, okay, this is coming to an end. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And then a lot of things we worked for, it was like, damn, like, and I didn't know what was next. You know, I'm a high achieving person and, you know, people already knew like, okay, this is fairly a successful person. And just being in a space where you're like, damn, I don't know if I'm still going to be that guy. You know what I'm saying? And it's tough. You know what I'm saying? Like I was really going through, through it. You know, what really saved me it was that it was during the holiday. So you see family. So it's mm. making you happy because you're seeing your cousins and everybody. But energy like, was different. The energy was different around the time, thankfully. But I was going through it, man. Like I was really going through it. And so that's why I think I remember like those details because I was like, mm. the, I had times where I was like, yo, the way I'm feeling, never again. Like I was really telling myself stuff around that time. Like I'm never feeling this way again. Like any worries that I had, whether it were for money or just friendship or whatever, I was really like clam like, you know, I'm 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 spiritual. I'm I'm a believer, you know? No doubt. So I was really like claiming these things, you know, like, and so that's what I remember. So Got you. Business, you know, people say business is business and strictly financial, but business is personal. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm saying? I, you know what? Yeah. I had that mindset that business yeah. is business. Um, I am learning this year, it's been challenging that, yeah. you know, like some of your personal spills over into your business yeah, and it could affect it. Business is personal, man, like, I can I can agree with the whole concept of business business and strictly financial to a certain extent yes yeah. but when that business feeds your family and that business actually take, takes care of your personal life therefore business is personal mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying like because if something hurts your business it will also hurt your, your personal life which would affect even your personal feelings you're not gonna start you're not gonna look at things from a business perspective you're gonna really think with personal emotions about Facts. your business yeah, so no doubt. so I'm saying all that to say that my partner is a personal friend now because yeah, we're, we're no making doubt. bread together you know what I'm saying but you know I linked up with my good friend Marquis with whom I'm partner today you know and uh together we kind of had to sit down man I told him like, I remember he came to my crib I was like dude like if we ain't going to be millionaires doing this thing, man, I don't even want to do it, man. Mm. Like, that's really what it is. Like, at this point, just before I get back to doing this real estate stuff, man, like, it's either we're going to go to the millions or it's okay, man. Right, let me think about other shit. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, I'm not trying to do this. And he told me the same thing to do. That's exactly how I'm feeling, man. Like, I wanted to make sure. That's why I came here that you were, like, we're on the same page about it. You know what I'm saying? And we kind of discussed, okay, what's the game plan? How do we get to become you a millionaire and I'm a millionaire? Not about like a million dollar business. No, I'm talking about a... you got to be a millionaire and I got to be a millionaire. Nah. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> because it's two different things, man. You, you said can... I got to go home with my own uh, crown bag mm-hmm. that, that got about a million dollars in there. You go home with your own crown yes. bag. I don't want to split it. Yeah, and we did the... Here's the thing about VAs, man. I think that's going to be probably a gem for like a lot of people looking into hiring VAs. Is that a lot of the VAs that don't work too long for companies because anybody is hiring VAs now. Even mm-hmm. when they don't have an established business or a long-term business, it's easy to hire a VA because it's two, $2,000, $3,000, right? And those VAs, when I talk to them and listen to them, they're telling me like, hey, I've worked for wholesalers before, but only for two months. They fired me from either that wholesaler didn't know what they were doing or they're just out of business. And what they look for is not really the pay, how much you pay them. We pay our VAs, the top VA gets three three dollars an hour. We pay VAs $2 an hour. But you know what they're looking for? They're looking for long-term you mm. commitment. You know what I'm saying? Because they can get $5 an hour somewhere else, but only for two months. Or come get half of it here, but you can work for me for three years because I'm not going nowhere. I'm always going to be in business, whether wholesaling or Some, something, something in real that I'm going to need you in. So, yeah. And then we've shown that to them because we pay them on time. We we there. Like, as long as you, you, you do your job, you're going to be here. We're not, gonna, we're not out of business anytime soon. You know what I'm saying? So, but what type of KPIs do you put on your VAs to make sure that they're actually meeting their goals? You're asking good questions, man. You, 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 I, I like that, man. You really know the business. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking good questions. So um, so right now, uh, really, I mean, for VAs, it's pretty simple. Like, the VAs job is pretty stream. Our, at least VAs, their job is really streamlined, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, they don't need to know all the numbers. They don't even need to know how to negotiate deals. That's not their job. You know, we have an acquisition team for it. So the only thing that we really look at for VAs is how many, how long they work versus how many leads they're sending us, right? That's the most important thing. So, so when you say how long they work, how long they've been making calls? How long they actually actively make calls? Phone, the talk time. Talk time. Talk time. Oh, yeah. so you monitor talk time. We monitor talk time. So okay. we can kind of see, because we understand, like, look, if you... If you uh, have a VA working eight hours a day, right, 
trust me, out of the eight hours, they're really giving you maybe four to five quality hours where they're really working. The other three hours, they're already like tired. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? So that's what we're really looking at the time where they're actively like doing their job, right? So we look at how long, I mean, uh, what's their talk time versus the leads that they send within that talk time, mm. right? So now, of course, you know, we also look at, you know, how many of the leads that they're sending us that we're actually closing. But it's really important for us at the VA level to just make sure they're sending us enough quality leads. It's not their job again to convert those leads. We just need them to send us leads. So now with that information about KPIs, KPIs is a very, like, it's, it's widely used in the, whole, in the real is. estate space, right? But the problem with KPIs is that it's not about just having all the KPIs. It's about what are you doing with those KPIs, mm -hmm. right? Like, I was actually talking to somebody about, like, uh, because they're saying, yeah, send me some Excel spreadsheets so I can track my KPIs. I told him, I was like, look, in my business, I reverse engineered it. I didn't have KPIs when I started. I had to start first and figure out what I needed to track as I was going through the business. And that's only what I really needed to track to scale my business that I'm tracking. I'm not tracking a bunch of stuff just so I can have KPIs. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, for my VAs, I only need to know how long it takes someone to talk to send me leads. That's mm. what I need to know. You know what I'm saying? Because I know what Efficiency. I Efficiency. Because that's all, that's what, that's the information I need to help them back. If mm. I need to train them, if I need to do anything, right? And of course, we listen to calls. I'm, I'm not sure these are KPIs, but we, we have call recordings to quality control them and make sure they actually saying the right thing, stuff like that. But And you got another VA to do that. Yeah, we have Christy, call center manager. She sends us reports and all that stuff. She tells us how many leads people are sending, all that stuff. I don't even look at our call center, bro. Nice. I don't even look at that. Like I just read reports. Only if I really want to like do a quality control, then that's when I do it. But like they don't know what I'm doing. I'm just I randomly <laughs> just check and it, it, it checks out, you know. And she's doing a great job, you know what I'm saying? Gotcha. So again, as far as the VAs, I don't have a lot of KPIs. I just need to know talk time. I mean, the leads are sending, so that way I can see where my best VAs. I can because dig if it. you're not sending me leads, then there's a problem. Mm. And then on the back end, we're gonna see the leads you're sending. If at some point you send leads that our acquisition team cannot convert, we're going to take over acquisition team to see why they cannot convert. But we're also going to see the leads you're sending to see, well, are they quality leads? Then we can check the, the quality of, the, of your leads. If we see, in fact, after listening to the calls, after checking the numbers and everything, that they're, in fact, good quality, then we go back to acquisition team and see, hey, why you cannot convert those leads? You know mm. what I'm saying? Stuff like that. So, yeah. VAs, we give them some metrics. We give them some numbers. We give them a quick training based off Zillow and the MLS to kind of be able to tell really quick because they're on the phone. They only have a couple minutes, right? Mm -hmm. To really quick tell that this person is asking too much or the within a range that we can work with. Again, the VAs don't need to know that something is going to actually make sense or work because mm -hmm. the moment you make your VA do all that work, now it's no longer streamlined for them. They're going to get confused. You're going to get frustrated as a boss. Mm -hmm. The VA's job is just to identify that this may work with within range. Let me push it. Mm. And the acquisitions team is going to actually do all the negotiation and really make it like a perfect deal. Like, okay, let me just be honest, man. Like during the during the, the pandemic, a lot of like local investors, they were kind of scared. So it was kind of tough to work with like, like an, an investor like you, for example, that just says you, you have your own money, right? Mm -hmm. But institutional investors, they were getting, they're getting Wall Street money. Mm -hmm. for, you remember the interest rate was like zero, like mm -hmm. essentially, right? So they're getting that kind of capital. So they were more aggressive as far as buying. So hedge we knew we were, the hedge fund and stuff. So we were aware of that. So we were sending them all the deals, mm. right? So at some point, like, dude, right now I'm seeing a decrease now. We're kind of working with some local investors now, but we pretty much got to 90% of our business. We're just sent, working with hedge funds. Mm. That's just what happened because we kind of understood that, okay, they're the one with the money now and they're buying. Let's just, a simple email, what is your buy box? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What are you looking for? Mm. They'll tell you, they'll send you a little spreadsheet. They'll tell you what they're looking for. And we customize our front-end research of property based off it kind of like, you know, a an average of what most of these hedge funds were looking for. I could dig it. And then it was a smooth transaction. You know what I'm saying? Like it was pretty much, we get the property, they already we already knew that this is something they'll buy. Mm -hmm. It was quick. Now, in the midst of as we buying, pro we trying to get properties, we'll come across some deals that will work for local investors. Then we'll reach out to some, you know, even myself. That's why I picked up a couple of flips on myself. You know what I'm saying? Or I want to hold some properties, then I can identify them. But uh, those, but uh, for the most part, hedge funds, man, like they, they played a big role in our business. We have about five of them that buy a lot, like in the markets we're in, like Georgia, Texas, 
Florida and Alabama. That's what oh, I'm so you're in different markets too? Yeah, we're in four markets. Yeah. Got you. Got that's you. That's another thing. You got to kind of scale beyond just the market you're in. He's a lot of people um, have a pessimistic mm-hmm. um, mindset mm-hmm. about wholesaling mm-hmm. because a lot of Why people do, a lot of people do it wrong. Mm. That's a good point. You know what I mean? So people are just like, man, wholesalers are messing up the game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what do what what do you what do you um what do you feel about that? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, in the sense of like, there are a lot of people who don't know how to comp par- properties correctly. Mm-hmm. Therefore, they send bad information when they send deals. They don't give you estimated repairs and things mm-hmm. of that nature. You know how do you how do you feel about like you know when people say have a negative mindset about wholesaling? I can understand that because I mean even me although I own a wholesaling you know company I. We, I look at other wholesalers, not all of them, but I know like, okay, you guys are not really doing it right. So I can mm-hmm. tell, I understand that. Um, but I think that, um, you know, wholesaling, because it's that one of the lowest entry point of real estate, because you know the whole like no money and no credit. So you kind of have everybody, you know mm. what I'm saying? Like, you know, you can be a nurse, but you want to wholesale. You can like, you like <laughs> everybody and their moms uh-huh. want to wholesale. You know what I'm saying? Right, so right. I think that kind of creates a problem where people actually have no real passion or really expertise at all, but they just know that it doesn't take big risks. They They're seeking get opportunity it's, without the right foundation exactly. to really execute so, it. And that, that's a real problem, you know? And that's one. And number two, man, like wholesaling, man, like for those that actually look at it bad, it's like they also like don't understand really what they're talking about in a sense Facts. because- Wholesale. I mean, I think the it's term, the key to real estate. That's what it's, I'm saying, a, it's the acquisition. Term, the term wholesaling. I don't know if I'm wrong, but you know, it doesn't even exist in the real estate dictionary. I agree. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, wholesaling yeah, yeah. is essentially. I've heard concept. that like several times, and yeah, I agree with the you statement. Know, you know, wholesaling is essentially a term based off the fact that we have retail properties, and when you get that, is, when you get something that's not retail, it must be wholesale discount. It must be discount or wholesale mm-hmm, price. Mm-hmm. I guess so, but. That's the whole thing about wholesaling, but really what's really going on is the, the art of finding good deals and Facts. acquisitions. That's really what it is. And you have the hustlers and the business owners like myself. You know what I'm saying? So to the wholesalers, they got to kind of get to a point where they stop hustling and mm. really look at this like, okay, this is a real business opportunity. Got you. If you have people like Benny that started hustling and kind of got to the point where we knew it was a business opportunity, created an actual corporation around this, mm-hmm. and we're making millions of dollars then you can do it as well. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's what it is. Like people are just hustling too much mm. and they're messing up the game. But it's an actual real business, man. This is one thing I understand, man. Like it's not about the volume as far as like, it's not about the amount of deals you close. It's about the quality of deals. Facts. Like because um, in uh, June, for example, we made $400,000 that month and we closed, nice. I think, 10 deals. But we had four deals that made us $250,000. You know what I'm saying? Out of 10, I think 12 deals in June, right? Ah. In June, we closed 12 deals, $400,000 in June, but only four deals made half the the, the money, essentially, or Mm -hmm. more than half the money. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that in June, that's when I realized, I was like, well, it's about the quality, like how much you make per deal. So I can tell you, hey, man, we only closed two deals this month, but each of them were like 100 apiece. Got you. And then the other guy is saying, yeah, we closed 12 and he only made 50 grand. So who's really winning? You know what I'm saying? So the advice I'm going to tell people is like in your process, just make sure that you're really milking deals, man. Like so you can make as much as you can in a deal. How do you um, wholesale hmm. in Houston or Dallas and you're not there? Hmm. Virtual wholesaling. Yes. So we had to, uh, it's possible. First of all, just to give a simple answer, it's possible. You can do it, right? Because you have the internet, you have technology, you know? So, you can pretty much go to wholescalersdata.com, wholescalersdata.com. You get you to prop stream, and then you uh you pretty much pull a list from there and blast SMS blast that list and see who's interested in selling. And then you go from there, you know, from any market. And then you can join Facebook groups in those markets to find buyers. It can be that simple, right? But for us, from a business perspective, because we have a staff and everything, we had to train our team to uh, kind of like in the Atlanta market to 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 work the Atlanta market as if it was a virtual market, mm-hmm. which means, you know, instead of our team necessarily going to see every property and doing mm-hmm. all that stuff, we're, we're not doing that anymore. We have a dispo team that still goes if needed to take pictures and stuff like that, but we close deals where we have the property on the contract that we haven't even seen. 
We send it to a buyer. The buyer is in charge of seeing the property and making a decision. We don't need to see the property. Mm. We've tested out many times in Atlanta and it's worked. Now it built our confidence to test it, to do it in other markets mm. because it's the same concept. Because the marketing is a list. You pull a list. You can pick any county in America, pull a list, and market to that list, right? The, the problem really becomes when it's like, okay, now I have this property. How do I see it? How do I make sure it's a good deal, right? So that's where we just send the properties to the buyers and they go check it out and they tell us what's up. Or we leverage our relationships with other wholesalers and other people that live there, you know? The markets that we are specifically, I think the only market we don't have anybody is Birmingham. Gotcha. That we don't even know anybody there, but we still like, we actually closed the deal or we are closing a deal today, something like that, you know? So that's the only market that we don't even have boots on the ground there. But that's Houston, fair. my best friend lives in Houston. So I haven't asked him for help yet, but if he comes down to it, I'll call him. 